Emily was given only 13 years to gaze upon the bridge that absorbed her labor for longer than that, but when Washington Roebling died, aged 89, in 1926, his health almost recovered. He had contemplated for over 43 years one of the greatest achievements in the history of beneficial technology. He could well feel fulfilled, his father had conceived the bridge but he had built it. Modern Suspension Bridges Suspension bridges are the kings of the bridge world. No other method of construction can span greater distances. Their use of materials is totally logical. Steel cables of the highest tensile resistance developed to date in any man-made material are used in tension to support through the vertical or inclined suspenders of wire rope the weight of the roadway and the traffic load on it. The massive and inexpensive concrete of the anchorages, in which the cables are tied through steel anchor bars to deeply embedded anchor plates, resists the pull of the cables by its weight. The steel towers, on top of whose saddles the cables are allowed to slide slightly to accommodate movements due to changes in temperature and loads on the roadway, are pushed down and compressed by the tension in the cables, as the center pole of a tent is compressed by the pull of the ropes. The longitudinal trusses of steel, like enormous beams, give rigidity to the roadway through their resistance to bending, so that the roadway does not move appreciably up and down under the moving loads. The harmonious collaboration of right materials, correctly shaped, makes a suspension bridge both a triumph of technology and a work of beauty. Gone are the days when Cass Gilbert, the architect of the Woolworth Building, insisted that the towers of the George Washington Bridge should be covered with stone. By a great consensus the structure of the steel towers was left uncovered to show with pride its obvious strength, Fig. 10.6. Great strides have been achieved since the days of the Roebelings. The longest American bridge. The Vera Sano Narrows Bridge at the entrance of New York Harbor spans 4, 260 feet between towers. A length over two and a half times that spanned by the Brooklyn Bridge. But the Humber Bridge in Great Britain is 4,626 feet long and the Akashikaikyo Bridge in Japan will span 5,800 feet in 1985. The Brooklyn Bridge used over 16,000 miles of cable wire. The Vera Sano has 143,000 miles of it. The improvements in suspension bridge design are not limited to an increase in dimensions and steel quantities. Many more subtle ideas have bettered their performance and reduced their cost. For example, both the George Washington Bridge and the Vera Sano have two superimposed decks which together with their side trusses give their decks a closed, rectangular pipe shape stronger against twisting than a single deck. On the other hand, the single deck of the Humber Bridge, which hangs from concrete towers, is a closed steel box with thin edges which splits the wind and prevents by its shape the tendency to excite twisting oscillations. These are also prevented by the suspenders that, instead of being vertical, are alternately inclined in opposite directions, thus partly acting as inclined stays. Fig. 10.7 Elegant and light in appearance, economical in design, safe in erection, suspension bridges are spreading to all parts of the world, connecting cities, nations, and continents and keeping busy the few specialized crews of wire spinners from continent to continent. Their ultimate limits have been approached but not achieved yet and their future is secure. They are making more of our Earth one world. 11. Form Resistant Structures Grids and flat slabs Ever since the beginning of recorded history, and we may assume even earlier, people have gathered in large numbers for a variety of purposes be they religious, political, artistic, or competitive. The large roof, unsupported except at its boundary, arose to shelter these gatherings, evolving eventually into the huge assembly hall we know today. As we shall see, no large roof can be built by means of natural or man-made compressive materials without giving the roof a curved shape, and this is why domes were used before any other type of cover to achieve large enclosed spaces. Even wood, a material that can span relatively short horizontal distances by beam action, see chapter 5, has to be combined in conical, 
cylindrical or spherical shapes were never large distances are to be spanned. Only after the invention of inexpensive methods of steel manufacture and the recent development of reinforced concrete did large flat roofs become possible. They have obvious advantages over dome roofs, their erection is simpler, and they do not waste the upper part of the space defined by the dome which is often superfluous, unnecessarily heated or air-conditioned. The simplest structural system for a flat rectangular roof consists of a series of parallel beams. Supporting some kind of roofing material. But if all four sides of the rectangle to be covered can be used to support the roof beams, it becomes more practical to set the beams in two directions, at right angles to each other, thus creating a grid. This two-way system pays only if the two dimensions of the rectangle are more or less equal. Loads tend to move to their support through the shortest possible path and if one dimension of the roof is much larger than the other, most of the load will be carried by the shorter beams, even if the beams are set in a grid pattern. A grid is a democratic structural system, if a load acts on one of its beams, the beam deflects, but in so doing carries down with it all the beams of the grid around it thus involving the carrying capacity of a number of adjoining beams. It is interesting to realize that the spreading of the load occurs in two ways, the beams parallel to the loaded beam bend together with it, but the beams at right angles to it are also compelled to twist in order to follow the deflection of the loaded beam, FIC 11.1. We thus find that in a rectangular grid loads are carried to the supports not only by beam action, bending and shear, in two direct irons but by an additional twisting mechanism which makes the entire system stiffer. To obtain this twisting interaction the beams of the two perpendicular systems must be rigidly connected at their intersection, something which is inherent in the monolithic nature of reinforced concrete grids and in the bolted or welded connections of steel grids. Even primitive people know how to obtain such twisting action by interweaving the beams of their roofs so that any displacement of one beam entails the bending and twisting displacement of all the others, FIG 11.2. Though rectangular grids are the most commonly used, skew grids, FIG 11.3, have, beside aesthetic qualities, the structural and economic advantage of using equal length beams even when the dimensions of the grid are substantially different thus distributing more evenly the carrying action between all the beams. We have seen in Chapter 9 how grids of trusses rather than beams become necessary when spans are hundreds of feet long, and how space frames constitute some of the largest horizontal roofs erected so far, covering four or more acres without intermediate supports. We must now go one step back to discover how an extension of the grid concept has become the principle on which most of the floors and roofs of modern buildings are built. Let us imagine that the beams of a rectangular grid are set nearer and nearer to each other and glued along their adjacent vertical sides. 7. Times underscore 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 aisle. Until they constitute a continuous surface. Such a continuous surface, called a 71 late or slab, presents all the advantages of a grid in addition to the ease with which it can be poured on a simple horizontal scaffold when made out of concrete. Reinforced concrete horizontal slabs are the most commonly used floor and roof surfaces in buildings with both steel and concrete frames all over the world. Their smooth underside permits a number of things to hang pipes and ducts, for instance without having to go around beams. The setting of the slab reinforcement on flat wooden scaffolds makes the placing of the steel bars simple and economical. In European countries concrete slabs are sometimes made lighter by incorporating hollow tiles, FIG 11.4. Through the strength of their burnt clay these tiles participate in the slab structural action, which is the same in all slabs whatever their material. Actually slabs, besides carrying loads by bending and twisting like grids of beams, have an additional capacity which makes them even stiffer and stronger than grids. This easily understood capacity derives from the continuity of their surface. If we press on a curved sheet of material attempting to flatten it, depending on its shape, the sheet will flatten by itself or have to be stretched or sliced before it can be made flat. For example, 
a sheet of paper bent into a half cylinder and then re. Least flattens by itself, Fig LL5A. It is said to be a developable surface, from the idea to unfold contained in the verb to develop. But if we cut a rubber ball in half, producing a small spherical dome, the dome will not flatten by itself if we lay it on a flat surface. Neither will it become flat if we push on it. It only flattens if we cut a large number of radial cuts in it or if, assuming it is very thin, it can be stretched into a flat surface, Fig 11.5b. The dome, and actually all other surfaces except the cylinder, are non-developable, unflattening surfaces. Because they are so hard to flatten, they are also much stiffer than developable surfaces. It will be more obvious why non-developable surfaces are better suited to build large roofs once we learn how such roofs sustain loads. Returning now to the behavior of a flat slab, we notice that under load it becomes dished it acquires the shape of a curved surface, with an upward curvature, fig 11.6. If it is supported only on two opposite parallel sides, it becomes a slightly curved upside down cylinder, but if it is supported on four sides, or in any other manner, it acquires a non-developable shape. Just as the half ball had to be stretched to be changed from a dome to a flat surface, the plate has to be stretched to change it from a hat to a dished surface. Hence the loads on it, besides bending it and twisting it, must stretch it, and this unavoidable stretching makes the slab even stiffer. Therefore we should not be amazed to learn that plates or slabs can be made thinner than beams. While a beam spanning 20 feet must have a depth of about one and one half feet, whether it is made of steel, concrete, or wood, a concrete slab covering a room 20 feet square can be made one foot deep or less. When slabs have to span more than 15 or 20 feet, it becomes economical to stiffen them on their underside with ribs, which can be oriented in a variety of ways. Nervi made use of ferro-cemento, a material he perfected, to build forms in which to pour slabs stiffened by curved ribs, which are oriented in the most logical directions to transfer the loads from the slab to the columns. These curved ribs, moreover, give great beauty to the underside of the slabs, Fig. 11.7. Ferro-cemento is a material consisting of a number of layers of welded mesh set at random, one on top of the other and permeated with a concrete mortar, a mixture of sand, cement, and water, Fig. 11.8. Flat or curved elements of ferro-cemento can be built only one or two inches thick, with except Ional tensile and compressive strength due to the spreading of the tensile steel mesh through the high-strength compressive mortar. First used only as a material to build complex molds in which to pour reinforced concrete elements, it later was transformed by Nervi into a structural material itself. Some of the masterpieces of Nervi owe their extraordinary beauty and efficiency to the use of ferro-cemento. Genius often consists of an ability to take the next step, and Nervi took it by realizing that ferro-cemento would be an ideal material for building boats. His lovely catch and Enerly, Fig. 11.9 was the first, but a large number of sailing boats have been built, mostly in Australia and the United States, with ferro-cemento hulls. They are easy to manufacture and even easier to repair in case of an accident. Strength through form. The stiffness of flat slabs, like that of beams, derives from their thickness, if too thin they become too flexible to be functional. It is one of the marvels of structural behavior that stiffness and strength of sheet-like elements can be obtained not only by increasing their thickness and hence the amount of required material, but by giving them curved shapes. Some of the largest, most exciting roofs owe their resistance exclusively to their shape. This is why they are called form-resistant structures. If one holds a thin sheet of paper by one of its short sides, the sheet is incapable of supporting even its own weight the paper droops down. Fig LLIOA. But if we give the side held a slight curvature up, the same sheet of paper becomes stiffer and capable of supporting as a cantilever beam not only its weight but also the small additional weight of a pencil or pen, 
Fig L L Ayub. We have not strengthened the paper sheet by adding material to it, we have only curved it up. This principle of strength through curvature can be applied to thin sheets of reinforced form-resistant STRL, cures. Concrete and has been efficiently used to build stadium roofs that may cantilever out 30 or more feet with a thickness of only a few inches, Fig 11.11. The shape of such roofs can be shown to be non-developable and hence quite rigid, but even developable surfaces, like cylinders, show enough strength, when correctly supported, to allow their use as structural elements. To demonstrate this property, Try to span the distance between two books by means of a flat sheet of paper acting as a plate. The paper will sag, fold, and slide between the book supports. If instead the sheet of paper is curved up and prevented from spreading by the book covers, it will span the distance as an arch, thick 11.12. Again the curvature has given the thin paper its newly acquired stiffness and strength. Nature knows well the principle of strength through curvature and uses it whenever possible to protect life with a minimum of material. The egg is a strong home for the developing chick, even though its shell weighs only a fraction of an ounce. The seashell protects the mollusk from its voracious enemy and can, in addition, sustain the pressure of deep water thanks to its curved surfaces. The same protection is given snails DD turtles, tortoises, and armadillos, from whom our medieval knight, may have copied their curved and relatively light armor. Curved surfaces We owe to the greatest of all mathematicians, Carl F. Gauss, 17771855, the discovery that all the infinitely varied curved surfaces we can ever find in nature or imagine belong to only three categories, which are dome-like, cylinder-like, or saddle-like. One how do the three categories differ? Consider the dome. Imagine cutting it in half vertically with a knife. The shape of the cut is curved downwards, and if you cut the dome in half in any direction, as you do when you cut a number of ice cream cake wedge slices, the shape of all the cuts is still curved downward, Fig 11.13. A dome-like surface has downward curvatures in all its radial directions. By the way, if instead of cutting a dome we were to cut in half a soup bowl, we would find the shape of all the cuts to be curved up, whatever their radial direction. Form resistant structures. One Gauss was so great a man that he noted in a small book a number of discoveries not worth publishing. When this booklet was found 50 years after his death, some of his negligible discoveries had been rediscovered and had made famous a number of his successors. Domes and hanging roofs, each with curvatures always in the same direction, either down or up, constitute the first of Gauss's categories. They are non-developable surfaces and have been used for centuries to cover large surfaces. We will discuss their structural behavior in chapters 14 and 15. Let us jump to the third of Gauss's categories, the saddle-like surfaces. In a horse saddle the curve across the horse, defined by the rider's legs, is curved downward, but the curvature along the horse's spine, which prevents the rider from sliding forward or backward, is upward, Fig 11.14. Saddle surfaces are non-developable and are used as roofs because of their stiffness. The Spanish architect Felix Candela built as a saddle surface what is perhaps the thinnest concrete roof in the world. Covering the Cosmic Rays Laboratory in Mexico City, it is only half an inch thick. Saddle surfaces have another property not immediately noticeable. As one rotates the saddle cuts from the direction across the horse to that along the horse, the curvature changes from down to up and, if one keeps going, it changes again from up to down. Therefore there are two directions along which the cuts are neither up nor down. They are not curved, they are straight lines, Fig 11.14. To prove this one has only to take a yardstick and place it across a saddle at its lowest point, the saddle is curved down, below the yardstick. If one then rotates the yardstick, keeping it horizontal, one finds that there is a direction along which the yardstick lies entirely on the surface of the saddle, in this direction the saddle has no curvature. 
Of course, if one rotates the yardstick in the opposite direction one locates the other no curvature section of the saddle, which is symmetrical to the first with respect to the horse's axis. All saddle surfaces have two directions of no curvature. Cut along these directions, their boundaries are straight lines. This property makes the saddle shape an almost ideal surface with which to build roofs. We can now go back to Gauss's second category, the cylinders. Imagine a pipe lying on the bore. If you cut vertically its top half the half, say, with the shape of a tunnel in any direction, you will notice that all of these cuts have a curvature down, except one, the cut along the pipe's axis is a straight line, fig. 11.15, the cylinder has no curvature in the direction of its axis. One may consider, then, the cylinder as a dividing line between the dome and the saddle. The saddles have two directions without curvatures, but as these two directions draw nearer and nearer, saddles become cylinders, with only one direction of no curvature. If this direction is now given a down curvature, the cylinder becomes a dome. If instead of considering the upper part of a cylinder, we consider its lower half the half, say with the shape of a gutter wee. I I. Find that the vertical sections of the gutter have curvatures up in all directions except one, the direction of the axis of the gutter. Hence, gutters and tunnels belong to the same category of surfaces having only one direction of no curvature. Barrel roofs and folded plates. We have seen that cylinders are developable surfaces and, as such, are less stiff than either domes or saddles. Even so, they can be used as roofs. Actually barrel roofs of reinforced concrete in the shape of half cylinders with curvatures down are commonly and inexpensively used in industrial buildings, fig 11.16, since they can be poured on the same cylindrical formwork, which can be moved from one location to another and reused to pour a large number of barrels on the same form. The mode of support of a barrel influences its load carrying action. If a barrel is supported all along its two longitudinal edges, Fig 11.17a, it acts as a series of arches built one next to the other and develops out pushing thrusts, which must be absorbed by buttresses or tie rods as in any arch. But if it is supported on its curved ends, Fig 11.17b, it behaves like a beam, developing compression. Above the neutral axis and tension below, see Chapter 5, and it does not develop thrust. One should not be fooled by the geometrical shape of a structure in deciding its load-carrying mechanism. Barrels should be supported on end walls or stiff arches so as to avoid unnecessary and costly buttresses or interfering tie rods. AIH The folded plate roof is analogous to a series of barrels. It consists of long, narrow inclined concrete slabs, but presents a sudden fold or change in slope at regular intervals, fig 11.18. Its cross-section is a zigzag line with valleys and ridges. The construction of a folded plate roof requires practically no formwork, since the flat slabs can be poured on the ground and jointed at the valleys and ridges of the roof by connecting the transverse reinforcing bars of the slabs and using a good cement grout or mortar to make the slabs into a monolithic roof. Folded plates carry loads to the supports along a two-fold path. Because of the stiffness achieved by the folds, any load acting on a slab travels first up the nearest ridge or down the nearest valley, and then is carried to the end supports longitudinally by the slabs acting as beams, fig 11.19. Folded plates must be supported at their ends. Since they consist of flat surfaces and folds, they act like an accordion that can be pushed in or pulled out with little effort and do not develop out pushing. Thrusts Form resistant structures It is both easy and instructive to fold a sheet of thin paper up and down, shaping it into a folded plate, and to support it between two books, possibly laying a flat sheet of paper over it, fig 11.20. The load capacity obtained by such a flimsy piece of material through its folds is amazing. A sheet of paper weighing less than one-tenth of an ounce may carry a load of books two or three hundred times its own weight. 
Any reader inclined to experiment further with folded paper can take advantage of both folding and arch action by creasing a sheet of paper into a folded barrel, according to the instructions. Of figure 11.21. The creased paper barrel requires buttresses to absorb its outward acting thrusts, but its load carrying capacity is even greater than that of a folded plate roof and may easily reach 400 times its own weight. Saddle roofs. Saddle surfaces, supported along their longitudinal curved edges, have a particularly elegant shape which blurs the distinction between structure and functional skin, fig 11.22. But saddle surfaces make some of the loveliest roofs when cut and supported along those straight lines which we have seen necessarily exist on any surface with both up and down curvatures, see fig 11.14. To visualize how a curved surface can be obtained by means of straight lines, connect by inclined straight line segments the points of two equal circles set one above the other, fig 11.23. The segments generate a curved surface called a rotational hyperboloid, used to build the enormous cooling towers of chemical plants. One of the most commonly used roof surfaces is obtained in a similar manner. Imagine a rectangle of solid struts, in which one of the corners Is lifted from the plane of the other three, thus creating a frame with two horizontal and two inclined sides, fig 11.24a. If the corresponding points of two opposite sides of this frame, one horizontal and one inclined, are connected by straight lines, for example by pulled threads, and the same is done with the other two opposite sides, the threads will describe a curved surface, although, being tensed, they are themselves straight, fig 11.24b. This surface has a curvature up along the line connecting the lifted comma to its diagonally opposite comma, and a curvature down in the direction of the line connecting the other two commas, fig 11.25. It is, therefore, a saddle surface. It carries the high-sounding name of hyperbolic paraboloid, wisely shortened to hypo by our British colleagues. One of the simplest hypo roofs is obtained by tilting the saddle and supporting it on two opposite corners. Whether the support points are on the ground or on columns, the roof looks like a butterfly ready to take off, fig 11.26. Its structural behavior is dictated by its curvatures. Compressive arch action takes place along the sections curved downward and tensile cable action along the sections curved upward. The two support points must be buttressed to resist the thrusts of the arch action, while the tensile cable action at right angles to it must be absorbed by reinforcing bars, if the high par is made out of concrete. Such is the stiffness of a high par that its thickness need be only a few inches of concrete for spans of 30 or 40 feet. The high par has other wonderful structural properties. For example, one could fear that such a thin structure, acting in compression along its arch direction, would easily buckle, a fear quite justified were it not that the cable action at right angles to the arches pulls them up and prevents them from buckling. Finally, to make the structural engineer even more enamored of these surfaces, under a uniform load, like its dead load or a snow load, they develop the same tension and compression everywhere. Therefore, its material, be it concrete or wood, can be used to its greatest allowable capacity all over the roof. The reader, who might not have seen too many of these magnificent roofs, may ask why do we not see many more of them? The answer to this question is that there is no silver lining without a cloud and the cloud that hangs over the high pars is the cost of their formwork, as it is for all curved surfaces. More will be said later about this problem. Complex Roofs the barrel and the rectangular high par elements are the building blocks for some of the most exciting curved roofs conceived by man. Combinations of these structurally efficient components are limited only by the imagination of the architect, guided by good structural sense. It is indeed regrettable that, with a few notable exceptions, modern architecture has not seen curved surfaces as glorious as some of the past and at the same time as daring as present-day technology can make them. This lack of achievement is due to at least three causes. On one hand, 
Curved surfaces are believed to be more complex to design than the flat rectangular shapes we are so used to. Usually quite the opposite is true. On the other hand, there is a gap between recent curved structures theory and the prescriptions of the codes. A domed roof proposed for a bank in California meant to cover a rectangular area 90 feet by 60 feet and to be only a few inches thick was vetoed by the local building department engineer because thin curved roofs were not mentioned in the code and, hence, did not exist. The engineer would only allow the roof to be built if two concrete arches were erected between its diagonally opposite corners to support it. Little did he know that the thin concrete roof was so stiff that it would support the two heavy arches rather than be supported by them. Finally, one must honestly add that in the United States the ratio of labor to material costs often makes thin shells, as these curved roofs are usually labeled, uncompetitive with other types of construction. The situation is reversed in Europe and other parts of the world. One of the most commonly encountered combinations of cylindrical surfaces is the grained vault of the Gothic cathedrals, Fig. 11.27. This consists of the intersection of two cylindrical vaults at right angles to each other, supported on four boundary arches and intersecting along curved diagonal folds called groins, which end at the four corner columns supporting the vault. The groins have often been emphasized visually and, possibly, structurally by means of ribs but, though these ribs may be aesthetically important, they are not needed to sustain the vaults. By their curvature and folds they are self-supporting. Among the great variety of combinations of rectangular hyper elements, two have become quite common because of their usefulness, beauty, and economy, the hyper roof and the hyper umbrella. To put together a hyper roof, Fig. 11.28a, consider building four hyperrec. Angular elements, starting as was done before with four rectangles but lowering, rather than lifting, one corner in each of them. The hyper roof is obtained by joining together the horizontal sides of each rectangular element so that all eight meet at the center of the area to be covered, while the lowered corners are supported on four columns or on the ground at the corners of the area. The straight inclined sides of the roof act as the compressed struts of a truss, and they must be prevented from spreading outward by means of tie rods connecting its corners, all around the covered area. The largest roof of this kind has been erected in Denver, Colorado, and measures 112 feet by 132 feet, with a 3-inch thickness. It rests directly on the ground at the corners and covers a large department store. The high part umbrella Umbrella, Fig. 11.28b, one of the most elegant roof structures ever devised, is produced by using four rectangular hyper elements, each with a corner lowered with respect to the other three, and put together by joining the two inclined sides of each rectangular element so that all eight meet at the center of the area to be covered. The horizontal sides constitute the rectangular edge of the roof and hide the tie rods. The shape of this hyper roof, which starts at a central point and opens up, resembles that of a rectangular umbrella and gives a visual impression of floating upward. Hyper umbrellas up to 90 feet square have been used, for example, in the terminal building of Newark Airport, Fig. 11.29. Such is the variety of shapes which can be composed by means of hypars that the Spanish architect Felix Candela has become famous all over the world by designing and building, mostly in Mexico roofs that use only this surface as basic element. Even though the hyper has particularly efficient structural properties when used as a horizontal roof, Candela has shown, in Mexico City how exciting its form can be when used vertically as in the Iglesia de la Virgen Milagrosa. Navi also has used vertical hypers as walls and roof in the monumental Cathedral of San Francisco, Fig. 11.30. Thin Shell Dams The greatest application of vertical, concrete thin shells has come not in architecture, however, but in dam construction. Although the world as a whole has so far only utilized 15% of the power obtainable from its natural or artificial waterfalls, the USSR has exploited 18% of their potential, the United States 70% and the three European Alpine countries, France, Switzerland, 
and Italy, 90%. Dams can be built to contain water by erecting a heavy wall of earth at the end of a valley and compacting it so as to make it watertight, Fig 11.31. These dams resist the horizontal pressure of the water behind them by means of their weight, as the weight of a building resists the horizontal pressure of the wind, and are called gravity dams. They are commonly used in developing countries, where labor is abundant and inexpensive and heavy earth-moving equipment rarely available. On the other hand, where valleys are deep and their sides are formed by rocky mountains, and 202 Y buildings stand up. Where concrete technology is well developed, dams are often built as thin, concrete, curved surfaces, which resist the pressure of the water through their curvature, Fig. 11.32. They may be thought of as curved roofs loaded with snow, but rotated into a vertical position, so that the snow load becomes horizontal. Some of the alpine dams are monumental structures reaching heights of over 1,000 feet and transmitting the thousands of tons of water pressure to the valley sides through their curvature. It may be thought ironic that SCH structures be called thin, when their thickness, which increases from top to bottom, may reach 10 feet. But thickness is never measured in absolute terms, what counts structurally is the ratio of the thickness to the Radius of the curved surface, which in a dam can be as low as 1,500. It can be realized how thin a 10-foot thick dam is by comparing it with the curved shell of an egg, in which the thickness to radius ratio is as much as 1 50th. A dam is, relatively speaking, 10 times thinner than an eggshell. One of the questions often asked of the structural engineer is whether any of the beautiful curved surfaces encountered in nature or imagined by the fertile mind of an artist could be used to build roofs or other structures. For example, one lovely, thin shell roof in California has been built in the shape of a square rigger sail, blown out by the wind but then turned into a horizontal position and supported on its four corners, Fig. 11.33. Although not a geometrically definable surface, it is structurally efficient. On the other hand, though an undulating surface can have a pleasant appearance, it would be quite inefficient structurally due to its tendency to fold like an accordion. We can learn a lot from nature, only if we know how to look at it with a wise and critical eye. This chapter must end with the melancholy realization that over the last few years thin, curved shells, lovely as they may be, have not been very popular in advanced technological countries for purely economic reasons. The main obstacle to their popularity, already mentioned, is the cost of their curved formwork. Innumerable procedures have been invented and tried to reduce the cost of the formwork or to do away with it altogether. Pneumatic forms were first used in the 1940s by Wallace Neff, who sprayed concrete on them with a spray gun. Dante Binney sets the reinforcement and pours the concrete on uninflated plastic balloons, and then lifts them by air pressure. The Binney procedure, in particular, has met with success almost all over the world in the erection of round domes of large diameter, up to 300 feet, for schools, gymnasiums, and halls. Of course, balloons are naturally efficient when round. These procedures cannot be well adapted to other thin shell shapes. A traditional method of construction, originating in the Catalonian region of Spain, has for centuries produced all kinds of curved thin structures without ever using complex scaffolds or formwork through the ingenious use of tiles and mortar. For example, to build a dome the Catalonians start by supporting its lowest and outermost ring of flat tiles on short, cantilevered, wooden brackets and grout to this first layer a second layer of tiles by means of a rapid setting mortar. Once this first ring is completed and the mortar has set in less than 12 hours workers can erect the next ring by standing on the first and adding as many layers of tile as needed by the span of the dome, usually not more than three layers. By the same procedure, spiral staircases are erected. Around interior courtyards, fig, 11.34, or cylindrical barrels of groined vaults built. The Guastavino. 
company whose Catalonian founder introduced this method to the United States toward the end of the 19th century, eventually built over two zero 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 buildings in which such tile shells were used. Two of them, the dome over the crossing of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, erected as a temporary structure while waiting for the completion of the church, and the groined vaults of the War College at Fort McNair, Virginia, Fig. 11.35, have by now been officially labeled United States landmarks. Unfortunately, the amount of labor required to set the tiles by hand has made even this procedure uneconomical. The last word on this method's use has not been said, however, since in the USSR thin shell specialists have extended the Catalonian methodology by replacing the small tiles with large, prefabricated, curved elements of pre-stressed concrete. These are erected without the need for any scaffold starting at one comma of a steel or concrete structural frame, Fig. 11.36. In structures, perhaps more than in any other field of human invention, little is new under the sun, but there is always room for ingenious modifications of old ideas, as well as hope for real breakthroughs. 12. The Unfinished Cathedral the origin of the Gothic cathedrals Western culture has been blessed by eras in which the themes of political, economic, philosophical, and aesthetic life built to glorious climaxes. Such was the period that brought forth modern physics at the beginning of our century, the expansion of music and art in the 17th, and the explosion of the Renaissance in the 15th. Superficially these are revolutions, but scholars and common sense have shown us that the ideas of a given time have germinated for decades, even centuries. As the sudden flowering of spring requires the long preparation of winter, cultural revolutions are the consequence of cultural evolution. A blessed convergence in 12th century France produced the Gothic Cathedral, one of the greatest achievements in the field of architecture. Beginning with modest, but substantial, Modifications of the Romanesque style, the cathedrals of the early Gothic period the 12th century evolved triumphantly into the high Gothic structures of the 13th, and the impassioned churches of the rayonant and the flamboyant styles of the 15th and 16th centuries. No structural style has spread as rapidly and as widely as Gothic. 25. Cathedrals were built between 1130 and 1230, within 100 miles of Paris, Fig. 12.1. And 80. Cathedrals and 500 abbeys were built in 90 years from 1180 to 1270 under three Capetian kings. Louis VIII, 1187 to 1226, his father, and his son. Gothic structures sprouted throughout England, Spain, Germany, and 206. Belgium, and the influence of French Gothic rolled outward through the Christian world under King Louis IX, Saint Louis, 1226 to 1270, to be blocked only in Italy, south of Milan, by the Renaissance and in Greece by the Byzantine tradition. Why did the Gothic arise at just this time in place like the Ile de France? Perhaps the main contributory factors were of a cultural and a political nature. Through Arabic translations the philosophy of the Greeks had, at long last, reached the center of Western culture. An entirely new atmosphere one of freedom of inquiry, of balance between transcendent religious thought and pragmatic study of man and nature made its appearance. Without losing his deep religiosity, the new man saw himself and the world around him as worthy of study. An understanding of the visible world became a better way of understanding the greatness of God. The churches reflected this new spirit. The Romanesque cathedrals had been massive, dark structures where pious men of the Middle Ages hid in fear and looked for God. The Gothic cathedrals conversely opened themselves to the light of the outer world, transforming it, making it unearthly. They appeared transparent and diaphanous. Their unfathomable height expressed the aspiration of humanity toward a God to be. 12.1 Loved and sought in the nave by the light of day, 
as well as in the penumbra of the candlelit chapels, fig. 12.2. On the other hand, the magnificence of the statuary and the monumentality of the structure in Gothic cathedrals were signs of a new well-being, a prosperity that allowed much of the worldly goods to be spent for spiritual purposes. This luxury could only have been amassed through a new social organization. The Capetian kings of France, by subtle guile and raw power, overcame at last the predominance of the small feudal lords, and thereby concentrated power in the court extending it over nearly the whole of France. Cities and towns flourished under the new system, commerce expanded greatly both internally and externally and a new type of man emerged, freed from serfdom to the local master and allowed to substitute money payments for personal services to the king. The University of Paris, second oldest in the world, opened in 1200 and the cathedral schools took over from the monasteries the responsibility for education and the spreading of new ideas. The Gothic style is a triumph of architectural invention. But even so, and contrary to the message of their exteriors and interiors, Gothic cathedrals do not have large spans, they are not as high as some monuments built centuries earlier, and they are not daring from a modern structural point of view. Nor is their appearance an honest expression of their structural behavior. Yet one of the most structurally minded of modem engineers, Pier Luigi Nervi, considered them masterpieces. All who look upon them are awed by their apparent immense height and by the miraculous play of light and shadows through their evanescent walls and between their slender piers. The Gothic cathedral is a victory of the architect. Overweight and space and the purest expression of spiritual needs met by the concreteness of heavy stone. How this miracle was achieved demands a simple description of the building of a cathedral. Gothic Spaces and Structures One amazing feature of the Gothic cathedral is that, although its architecture evolved through centuries, one is nevertheless able to describe a typical cathedral. Variations from this theoretical prototype are so subtle that one can easily recognize a Gothic church in all its common components, whether it was built in the 12th or in the 20th century. A cathedral, from the viewpoint of the church hierarchy, is merely the seat of a bishop, his cathedra, supported by the members of the cathedral's chapter. Hence, prime movers in the construction of Gothic cathedrals were the powerful bishops of France, men who mediated between Rome and the French kings. Bishop Milan de Nantel published, in 1225, a document proposing the reconstruction of the church at Beauvais, which had been destroyed by fire. He pledged at the same time, as a bona fides of his high seriousness, 10% of his income to the enterprise and requested the chapter to do the same. To make his request even more binding, he had obtained approval for it through a papal decree. It was the bishop who chose the master for the cathedral, a builder whose name has vanished from history and remains known only as the first master of Beauvais. Once these financial preliminaries had been thoroughly arranged, the construction could start, as it had been started in the two most important previous cathedrals of the High Gothic period in Chartres in 1194 and in Bourgs in 1195 and in the Royal Abbey of the Early Gothic period, St. Denis Indiana Paris, consecrated in 1140. The plan of a Gothic cathedral has the shape of a cross, fig 12.3. The lower arm of the cross is represented by the wide central nave, flanked by two, inner, aisles and, often, by two additional outer aisles. The horizontal arm of the cross, called the transept, extends outward at right. Angles to the nave and aisles. The main facade of the church is normally at the bottom of the nave, but the entrances at either side of the transept are often as magnificent as the main facade. Zero often the point of crossing between the transept and the nave is topped by a high spire. Beyond this crossing, the nave and aisles are prolonged into the choir, where the stalls for the chapter members and the main altar are located. The upper arm of the cross, the choir, is closed by the apse or chavette, a semicircular wall pierced, usually, by radial. Chapels. Additional chapels often appear along the sides of the outer aisles. The span of the nave could 
could reach 4 to 5 feet, while the aisles are generally 20 to 30 feet wide. The inner aisles curve behind the altar to create the ambulatory, onto which open the radiating chapels of the Chavette. As can be seen from this description, the plan of a Gothic cathedral does not differ much from that of most of our churches. It is when we begin to consider the vertical structure of the cathedrals and the interior spaces they define that we meet an amazing conception, totally new from both an architectural and a constructional point of view. To obtain a feeling of aspiration toward heaven, the Gothic masters used two architectural means, height and light. Height was not upper. Zero yet, it must be noticed that some cathedrals have no transept, like the Cathedral of Parma. 10. He ended suddenly but in successive steps, as the eye was led to the highest point in the enclosed space, the ceiling of the Chavette. The ceiling of the outer aisles was low as in the radiating chapels of the Chavette, the ceiling of the inner aisles was higher and in some cathedrals equal to that of the ambulatory, the ceiling of the central nave rose still higher, and that of the choir and the Chavette, highest. Thus in successive steps the eye is led to a point perhaps 150 or more feet above the level of the church floor. Fig 12.4 This visual climb is emphasized dramatically by the increase in light which follows the increase in height. The outer aisles are, if not dark, shadowy, the inner aisles have large windows and greater light, the nave and, above all, the chavette are inundated with light from the tall stained glass windows which made the high ceilings float above the entire church. All who have visited a Gothic cathedral are familiar with this feeling of being transported toward the incorporeal ceiling of the Chavette. Moreover, the colored glass of the windows transforms the light in the cathedral. It does not seem to come from the outside, but has an ethereal, otherworldly quality that separates the dematerialized interior from the reality of the outside world while avoiding the feeling of containment and oppression typical of the Romanesque cathedrals. The gradation of light towards the top of the church is modulated by two elements appearing in all the vertical walls into which windows are opened. The lighted areas are divided into horizontal zones, the Triforium, a band arabesqued by carved arches, which in some cases has small window openings at its Top, and the clear story, the area of the long, tall window subdivided into three or four slender compartments by means of thin stone mullions, often starting in the triforium and moving up to the clear story in straight vertical lines as thin as pencil strokes. Thus, the light from the clear story is supported by the darker light from the triforium, giving additional modulation to the three light steps of the outer aisles, the inner aisles, and the chavette and nave. Six light gradations leading the eye to the vertex create a tremendous effect even on a single wall, but this effect is greatly emphasized by the fact that the three main light gradations occur on three separate walls, moving into the inner space from the outer limits of the enclosure or vessel. The first triforium and clear story are open in the walls of the outer aisles, the second in the wall between the outer and the inner aisles and the third in the walls between the inner aisles and the nave. The crescendo of light does not occur on a plane but on a succession of inward moving planes that make the interior space soar, like a stepped pyramid, to the vertex of the cathedral. Height and light have produced the miracle. We have referred vaguely, so far, to the ceiling of the various parts of the church in order to end our description with the last great feature of the Gothic interiors. While Romanesque churches are usually covered by trust, wooden roofs, or stone barrel vaults, which do not permit large window openings, the aisles, nave, transept, choir, and chavette bays of a Gothic cathedral are all covered by masonry vaults. One may understand, and justify, the entire masonry structure of the Gothic churches by analyzing their ribbed, groined, four-sided vaults. These consist, usually, of the intersection of two half-cylinders, Fig 12.5, and, thus, allow arches to appear on all four sides of the bay they cover a feature that obviously increases the quantity of light at the roof level. The path of the loads carried by the ribbed, groined vaults makes the structure of the cathedral self. Explanatory. The intersections of the two cylinders of a quadripartite, four-sided, vault constitute arched. 
folds or groins along its two diagonals, fig 12.5, which, as we have seen in chapter 11, give greater rigidity to the vault in the direction of the groins. Hence, the vault's weight tends to be channeled by the groins to its forecomers, where it is supported vertically by the piers. The downward curved ribbed groins, acting as arches, thrust out on the piers. There are two ways of resisting these outward thrusts, by inserting tie rods, either along the four sides of the bay or diagonally across its comers, or by supporting laterally the top of the piers by means of buttressing. Elements, see Chapter 9. The Gothic masters rejected the first solution as a permanent solution for both aesthetic and practical reasons. Tie rods across piers would have ruined, visually, the vault-defined spaces, and their rusting, even if they were covered with lead, might, in time, have cracked the masonry in which they had to be anchored. Therefore, the first preoccupation of the masters was to reduce the magnitude of these thrusts. They had little knowledge of structural theory, but experience had shown them that pointed arches thrust out less than circular arches. The main difference between Romanesque and Gothic arches lies in the pointed shape of the latter, which, besides introducing a new aesthetic dimension, has the important consequence of reducing the arch thrusts by as much as 50%. In a written statement in the year 1350 the builders of the Milan Cathedral went so far as to assert that pointed arches do not thrust on buttresses, but they probably knew this not to be true and used it as a last line of defense against their French consultant, Mignot, who had suggested different arch. Proportions The Gothic arch is a typical example of an aesthetic feature dictated by structural requirements and may be said to be more correct than a circular arch in the context of large roofs. As pointed out in Chapter 11, grained vaults even if not ribbed are self-supporting when their thrusts are resisted, but the masters emphasize the role of the groins and of the side arches by means of ribs, which fool the eye into believing that they channel the loads into the piers. By prolonging these ribs along the pier's surface without interruption sometimes all the way to their bottom the Gothic architects created a series of continuous lines which are a pseudo-visual part of the loads and seem to express on the interior of the cathedral a fake. Frame stru structure Fig 12.6. If the piers had not been so tall and thin to achieve the visual quality of the space wanted by the masters, the frame could indeed have supported the structure. But the aesthetic requirements, of primary importance to these supreme artists, did not allow the piers to resist th horizontal arch thrusts or, sometimes, even to support the weight of the vault's masonry, which consisted of an outer envelope of finished stone filled with rubble concrete. Since the piers would bend under the action of the thrusts and, possibly, buckle under the action of the vertical loads, the groined vaults, although ribbed, had to be buttressed. Here again two solutions were available to the masters, internal buttresses, obtained by connecting the piers of the nave to those of the aisles by means of transverse walls, as in St. John the Divine in New York, or buttressing elements external to the church. There is no question that the first solution would have frustrated the goal of creating a single, open, high, lighted inner space. It was rejected. Instead, the vaults were buttressed by means of wall-like pillars set outside the church, which at first were attached to its walls and acted as external sheer walls, see chapter 7, but beginning. In about 1170, were set away from the church walls and connected to them by means of inclined. Flying buttresses which support the groined vaults like slender, gigantic fingers, fig 12.7. The interior of the cathedral thus remained linearly pure its space uncluttered by intersecting structural elements while the exterior became cluttered with a magnificent forest of vertical pillars and flying buttresses. The logic of this structural system is unchallengeable and the result superb. The refinement of the exterior elements, designed by men who were mainly guided by geometrical concepts of proportion and had little quantitative understanding of structures, is nothing less than amazing. The flying buttresses, for example, have a straight upper surface and a curved lower surface so that their almost straight axis follows the line of the vault's thrusts, while their slightly arched shape shows how they support their own dead load by arch action, without introducing tensile stresses in their masonry. 
In order to reduce the dimensions of the pillars, two of them, rather than one were often used to resist the vault's thrusts, connected by flying buttresses in two flights and two tiers, fig 12.7. Moreover, heavy pinnacles were added on top of the outer pillars, which were their own. Weight pushed in with the vault's thrusts. The more nearly vertical resulting forces acted on the pillars with an increase in compression which the masonry could well take and a reduction in bending which might have caused unwanted tensile stresses. It has been thought that even the heavy statuary, profusely spread over the outer surface of the church, was located at times so as to combine its vertical load with the horizontal vault's thrusts and act as pinnacles. The cathedral masters were supreme artists first and second, out of necessity, good engineers. Almost nothing is known about how they designed their structures, but we may presume from their later organization that they belonged to strictly controlled guilds and only became masters after a long apprenticeship, which must have proceeded through the steps of a stiff hierarchy. Masters consulted among themselves, but did not divulge their secrets to outsiders not even to the commissioners of their work. One of them killed his son upon learning that he had leaked trade secrets to the bishop of the cathedral they were building. There seems to be little doubt that one of the basic methods they used to acquire knowledge was the honored process of trial and error. As time went on they became more and more daring, in the 156 years separating Chartres. 1194, and Palmer, 1350, the piers of the cathedrals became three and a half times thinner. Even so, the use of structural materials in the cathedrals was very conservative, their masonry is stressed to a small fraction of its capacity. On the other hand, the articulation of their structure is quite daring since it makes their stability depend on the interaction of all its elements. While all its components work harmoniously, a cathedral is a safe structure, but if even a minor component malfunctions, the entire frame is endangered. By pushing the complexity of the resisting elements to the limit in order to attain new aesthetic goals, the masters, unguided by sound technical knowledge, were bound to court disaster. And this brings us to the tragic story of the most beautiful cathedral of them all, Beauvais. Saint Pierre at Beauvais. Beauvais was a lovely medieval town about 40 miles north of Paris, until the Germans destroyed it during World War II. Of its 55 churches only three stand today. Luckily, one of them is the Cathedral of Saint Pierre. Saint Pierre has been called the most famous and elongated of the French cathedrals, the marvel of the medieval style, its ideal, the Parthenon of French architecture. And yet Saint Pierre, after collapsing twice, was never finished. It has no tower, no nave, and no aisles. This most celebrated of French cathedrals consists of a choir, a transept, and a chevet. How did this happen? We have seen how in 1225 Bishop Milan started the construction of Saint Pierre and appointed the first master, whom he may have known at Charters a cathedral also built, like Saint Pierre, after an earlier church was gutted by fire. The first master was certainly familiar with Chartres and Bourgs. And he was both an original artist and a good engineer. He conceived the cathedral in the great tradition of his predecessors. Nonetheless, he contributed a number of new variants to their basic themes. To begin with, he made his cathedral more luminous by increasing the span between the piers of the central vessel up to 27 feet, so as to allow more light to come into the nave from the aisles. He also made the aisles more luminous by openings in all their walls chapels, triforia, and clerestories, see fig 12.6. He elevated the vaults of the choir and the chevet which eventually reached the unprecedented height of 157 feet 6 inches and pierced the outer walls of the church with the lightest clerestories ever dared. His conception was grandiose, but he was also capable of devising the subtlest space modulations in order to increase the triumphal march. From the dot church entrance toward the chevet. The spacing of the piers of the choir was not constant, but increased as one moved towards the chevet, 
Fig 12.8. The radiating chapels of the Chavet are relatively small and each is lit by three windows, subdivided into two narrow compartments by thin mullions. These lead to the triforium of the ambulatory, which, in turn, supports the amazingly light triforium and clear story of the Chavet, see Fig 12.6. Uninterrupted ribs rise from the bottom of some piers to become the ribs of the vaults. The interior of Saint Pierre is rightly considered the masterpiece of High Gothic. On the exterior the vaults are supported by two piers, connected to the main vessel of the church by two flights of flying buttresses in two tiers, see Fig 12.7. The flying buttresses are but appear in the wall of the church, right above heavy stones supporting enormous statues. The transepts were built in. The flamboyant style in the 16th century, but the church has no west facade, except a naked wall. From which protrudes the small nave of the original Carolingian church, dwarfed by the Gothic Chavet, Fig 12.9. The first master worked at St. Pierre for 20 years. He set solid foundations and erected the Chavet up to the level of the inner aisles. The execution of his masonry is technically perfect crafted with well-cut stones and careful joints. Some historians believe that in his design, of which we have no trace, the height of the main vaults of the choir was lower than that of the present vaults. After five years of work under another anonymous master, called the second master, the very daring third master, also unknown by name, took over and finished the choir and the chavet in 1272. And then, quite without warning, the main vaults of the choir collapsed on November 29, 1284. Why the structure stood for 12 years and then suddenly collapsed remains a mystery to this day. It is true that the masonry of the third master is of lower quality, but no obvious faults in either construction or design have been discovered so far, even through the use of the most advanced methods of structural analysis. Violet Leduc, the great architectural historian and restorer of the 19th century, suggested that the slow creeping of the masonry mortar could have transferred some of the load of the walls to the piers, dislodging at the same time the heavy stones supporting the massive statues. These stones were supported by a wall pier and by two extremely slender outer columns, Fig 12.10. According to Violet Leduc, the added weight on these two columns buckled them, some are actually buckled today, allowing the heavy stones to rotate. Outward. This would have, in time, weakened the connection of the upper flying buttress to the wall pier and caused its fall. Once the flying buttress fails, the entire vault system loses stability and the vaults are bound to collapse. Robert Mark has suggested, instead, that the alternate action of the wind on either side of the church overstressed the intermediate external pillar, which failed. Jean Heyman has proved that the cathedral was perfectly stable under its own dead load and attributes the collapse to a minor unknown cause. Stephen Murray, through careful study of the reconstructed masonry, has reached the conclusion that the intermediate external pillar, which did not reach ground but was supported by an arch, a port. EM5, Fig 12.4, collapsed. There have been no earthquakes recorded in the area and the foundations of the first master do not indicate uneven settlements. In spite of all this learned research, to this day we do not know with certainty why the vaults collapsed. The choir repairs were finished in 1337. But, unfortunately, the new unknown fourth master in charge of the reconstruction, apparently attributing the collapse to an excessive span between the piers of the nave and of the inner aisles, decided to cut in half these spans by erecting six intermediate piers in the main vessel of the Chavet and four in the inner aisles, see Fig 12.8. Although the interior of the church is still magnificent, see Fig 12.6, the visual reconstruction, by Robert Branner, of its appearance in 1272, Fig 12.11, shows how much lighter and more daring had been the design of the first master. The erection of the interpolated piers changed the choir vaults into sexpartite, six-sided, vaults, fig 12.12, thereby requiring the construction of additional external pillars and flying buttresses, 
in two flights and two tiers. Whether the choir could have been repaired without changing the interior of the first master remains a moot question. The fact is that the vaults have been standing ever since 1337, proving that the engineering judgment of the fourth master was correct, if possibly over-conservative. The Hundred Year War and the English occupation of the Lie de France interrupted work on the church for the next 150 years. In 1500, Martin Cambages, the fifth master of Beauvais and the first known by name, was given charge of the construction of the transepts. When he died in 1532, the sixth master, Jean Vast, finished them. In 1544 discussions began about the construction of a tower over the crossing. There were partisans of a wooden tower and partisans of a stone tower. Outside masters were consulted. Finally, in 1558, the unwise decision was made to build a stone tower, which Jean Vast started in 1564 and finished in 1569. It reached the incredible height of 502 feet, thick 12.13, and the sight of it alarmed more than enchanted the members of the chapter from the moment it was completed and with sound reason. Two years later, the four central piers of the crossing, which supported the tower, were found to be out of plumb by two and four inches on the Chavette side, and by six and eleven inches on the unbuilt nave side. These last two piers, unbuttressed by the nave, were giving in under the enormous added weight of the tower. It was suggested that the first two bays of the nave be built immediately, but the chapter vacillated, sought additional expert advice, and only decided to proceed on April 17, 1573. Thirteen days later, on April 30, Ascension Day, the tower collapsed just after the cathedral had been vacated by clergy and parishioners, who had started on a procession. The three men left behind were, miraculously, unscathed and since 1577 on Ascension Day a celebration is held in the cathedral to remind the faithful of this miracle. The horror created by the failure was such that nobody dared dismantle what remained of the ruins until a criminal was induced to attempt it with the promise of his life if he succeeded. Legend has it that he accepted the offer and had just started when he slipped, and would have fallen to the ground had he not grabbed a rope hanging from one of the roof beams. Thus, said a French historian, the rope that should have been the end of this wretch became his salvation. The fallen tower was never rebuilt. Money set aside for the construction of the nave had already been spent and the original impulse for the construction of the greatest of all Gothic cathedrals had been dissipated. Moreover, as the French historian Disjardin wrote, this was not the time to build cathedrals anymore. The schools for masters, sculptors, glaziers, and painters, which had been inspired by their construction, were dying all over the place. In 1605, the chapter took the decision to end the erection of Saint Pierre, to leave it as a choir, a chavette, and a transept, without a nave, fig 12.14. Thus it happened that while the greatest church of Christum, Saint Peter's Indiana Rome, whose construction lasted 181 years, from 1445 to 1626, was being triumphantly finished, the greatest Gothic cathedral was dying. Failure of the vaults at Beauvais in 1284 may have been due to a minor unknown fault in design or construction, but the tower collapse in 1573 shows a serious ignorance of structural principles and indicates that intuitive understanding of these principles had decreased rather than improved during the 350 years since the start of St. Pierre's construction. This may have been due to the decline of the trade guilds through a lack of transmission of their secrets from generation to generation. The Outsiders Advice given the chapter, leading to their choice of a stone tower, indicates that this lack of structural knowledge was widespread and not limited to the Beauvais guilds. Once more, Human factors political and economic lay at the bottom of a situation which was to have the gravest consequences in the field of an architectural and structural endeavor. 
It is ironic that only 200 years later the first scientific approach to structural problems was going to be undertaken in the same Isle de France, leading directly to the recent victories in our fight against gravity and wind. 13 Domes The largest roofs in the world 1 has only to mention their names, the Pantheon, Hagia Sophia, Santa Maria del Fura, St. Peter's, Armet's Mosque, St. Paul's, and then the Astrodome, the Louisiana Superdome, the Pontiac Stadium. Domes. Images of majesty and communion. Spaces enclosing and protecting 20,000, 40,000, 80,000 people who respond in unison to some of the basic emotions of the human spirit. Monuments defining a city and visible for miles around. Mountains and caves. Climaxes of the arts of an era, where architecture, sculpture, painting, and mosaics conspire to create a unique atmosphere, triumphant or subdued. Victories of technology over gravity and wind. These structures are the most perfect examples of spatial geometry, whether realized in stone, brick, concrete, or steel. No master builder's achievement has attracted humanity as has this most perfect of all shapes. Is it because of its platonic purity? Is it because of the separation it erects between the outer, undefined space and its well-defined enclosure? Is it because of the pious or joyous feelings of fraternity it elicits from the participants in its rituals? Or because of the equality created among the throngs? Perhaps the dome is the nearest materialization of heaven, the only man-made representation of the sky, and this is why a dome seems to protect us like the sky of a clear night, embracing us and our smallness and solitude. The perfect dome has no scale, no frame of reference. When small it may feel limitless, when large it may embrace us like a room. The image of Christ, the Pancreator, looms as immense from the dome of a small Byzantine church as from the inner surface of the largest cupola in the world. A dome. even more unfathomable in a mosque, where the absence of human images makes more difficult the measure of its dimension. Its abstract designs make the inner surface of a Muslim dome even more mysterious, while its brilliant colored tiles, flaming in the sun, make its outer surface aggressively more triumphant. Growing from its modest archaeological precursors into the superb vaults of Rome, symbols of world empire, the dome reached by a quantum leap the enormous dimensions of the Pantheon and spread all over the civilized world. Did this miracle happen because of the discovery of concrete and the availability of the water-resistant Pozzolana or was it due to aspiration towards eternity? These are a few of the obviously unanswerable questions elicited by the dome, the king of all roofs and the mecca of all believers, the sky of theater lovers and the egalitarian roof of sports fans. The dome is the greatest architectural and structural achievement of mankind in over 2,000 years of spiritual and technological development. The dome is structure. Whatever significance one may give to the dome, its structural behavior must be understood before its appearance on the architectural stage may be appreciated. Let us then ignore the minor differences of shape assumed by the dome over its historical development and think of it as a perfect half-sphere of a thickness small relative to its span. Whether supported over the crossing of a church or directly on the ground, the dome must carry its own weight and the weight of the live load, including the pressure and suction of the wind and, in northern climates, the weight of snow. It is obvious that these loads must be channeled to the ground, and, familiar with the behavior of arches, we intuitively realize that the dome does it along its curved vertical lines or meridians. The dome reminds us of a series of identical arches set around a circular base and meeting at their top, where they have a common keystone, Fig 13.1. Our intuition is correct, since the loads accumulate from top to bottom along the vertical meridians, which become more and more compressed as they approach the dome's support. What might surprise us upon a more careful inspection of the dome is the substantial difference between its small thickness and that of arches spanning the same distance. Another 
Cause of puzzlement might arise if we remember that arches thrust outward and require buttresses or tie rods to prevent their opening up. Since the dome has no apparent tie rods or buttresses, it soon becomes obvious that the dome is not just a series of arches set on a circle, one next to the other. What makes the dome behave differently is the fact that the hypothetical arches it consists of are joined together along the vertical sections of the dome, making it a monolithic structure. Its reduced thickness and the disappearance of buttresses and tie rods are due entirely to its monolithicity. The reduction in dome thickness as compared to arches is quite dramatic. While the thickness of a concrete arch varies between 1 20th and 1 30th of its radius, the thickness of a concrete spherical dome can be as small as 1 200 or 1 300 of its radius. The continuity of the dome's surface allows such reduction in thickness by introducing an action. Along its horizontal sections or parallels, Fig 13.1, that prevents the arched meridians from opening up. The parallels behave like the hoops of a barrel molding the staves, making them into a single surface. Figure 13.2 shows the, grossly exaggerated, deformed shape of a dome under load and makes it clear that the dome tends B0th to come down at its top and to open up at its bottom. The points on the upper part of its surface move inward, while those in its lower part move outward. These motions, which take place freely in an arch, are substantially prevented in the dome by the horizontal hoops. In the upper part the parallels become compressed in resisting the inward motions, which would reduce their radius, while in the lower part they become tensed in resisting the outward motions, which would increase their radius. While in an arch these deformations under load occur mostly by changing the shape of the arch, that is, by bending it, in the dome these deformations are extremely small, because, as we have seen in chapter 3, the deformations due to compression or tension are minute as compared to those due to bending. The prevention of the meridional deformations of the dome by the compressive or tensile hoop action of its parallels has two consequences. First, it makes the dome much stiffer and prevents the buckling of the compressed meridians. Thus the dome can be made thinner without endangering stability. Secondly, it prevents the opening up of the dome at its bottom, doing away with the need for external buttresses or internal tie rods. Actually, the bottom parallels in tension are the circular tie rod that prevents the opening up of the dome. The stiffness obtained by the combined action of the meridians, carrying the loads down, and the parallels, preventing large deformations by hoop action, is amazingly high. A reinforced concrete dome spanning 100 feet and only 2 or 3 inches thick will deflect at its top by not more than one tenth of an inch. This deflection is only 1 12 of its span. In comparison the deflection of a beam is 33 times larger or 1 360 of its span. Moreover, the opening up of a dome at its lowest parallel is even smaller than its deflection at the top. Figure 13.2 shows that the upper dome parallels tend to shrink under load, while the lower ones tend to elongate. At some point there must be FIN A parallel that neither shrinks nor elongates. It can be proved that under dead load this parallel makes an angle of about 52 degrees with the vertical axis of the dome. All the parallels above it are in compression, all those below in tension. This behavior of the parallels of a dome was not well understood by the dome builders of the past, and without exception the domes of antiquity as well as those of the Renaissance developed vertical cracks at their bottom due to the low tensile resistance of the masonry used in their construction. While hoops of wood beams, at times reinforced with iron bars, were introduced in some Renaissance domes to prevent these vertical cracks, it was not until the bases of the domes were circled with hoops of steel chain that the cracks were prevented from opening and stability achieved. A last basic property of thin domes must be mentioned before moving on to a description of some of their most famous examples. The reader may remember that the arch can be intuitively considered as the compressive analog of the tensile cable. It was referred to as the antifunicular shape acquired by a cable under given loads, when its funicular shape is frozen and flipped over, see chapter 9. 
When the loads on the cable are many and closely spaced, the shape of the cable in tension becomes a curve and its corresponding compressive shape is that of an arch. It is important to notice that since a cable changes shape depending on the number, value, and location of the loads on it, there is only one funicular shape the cable can assume under a given set of loads. Correspondingly, there is only one purely compressive arch shape for a given set of loads. But while a cable is flexible and changes shape when the loads on it change, an arch is rigid and cannot do so. It supports any new set of loads by a combination of compression along its curved shape and of bending. In other words, it acts partly as an arch and partly as a beam, and it is the beam action that causes its relatively large deformations. Here is where the dome presents an additional advantage with respect to the arch. Because it consists of a monolithic curved piece of material, it can also prevent the sliding of one meridian arch with respect to the next, by developing the anti-sliding stress we called shear in chapter 5. This additional mechanism can be shown to allow the dome to carry not just one, but any kind of load without changing shape and without developing bending stresses, provided the load be smooth as most loads on domes are. If one remembers how inefficient bending stresses are, since they use properly only the material away from the neutral axis, one realizes that in addition to all of its other characteristics the dome is an extremely efficient structure in terms of the use of materials. No wonder that domes, thin as they usually are, are stiffer and stronger than almost any other structure devised by man. Most modern domes are built of reinforced concrete, and the required tensile resistance of their lower parallels is obtained by means of reinforcing bars located along these parallels. These bars are of larger size than those toward the top of the dome, but one must not forget that reinforcing bars are required in concrete structures not only to absorb tension but also to create a cage of steel that keeps the concrete together. Therefore, bars are always set in the concrete of a dome both in the direction of the parallels and that of the meridians. Minute as the deformations of a dome may be, it would not be practical to allow its bottom to move in and out depending on the amount of load on it. Most domes are stiffened at their bottom by a strong ring, which to all practical purposes restrains the motion there. Figure 13.3 shows how the bottom ring, by preventing the opening up of the dome under load, necessarily bends the dome surface in its neighborhood and introduces in it a minor amount of bending stresses. These are snuffed out by the hoop action of the parallels, which, thanks to their stiffness in tension, do not allow the inefficient bending stresses to penetrate into the shell of the dome. Usually not more than 5% of the dome surface develops bending stresses near its support, while the rest develops only compression and tension. The Pantheon The largest dome of antiquity, dedicated to all the gods, was built by the Romans under the Emperor Hadrian in AD 123 and stands in all its glory to this day. The Pantheon, Fig. 13.4, a triumph of concrete architecture, could only be conceived and built after the discovery of Pozzolana concrete by the Romans, who were first to erect large monolithic structures and overcome the difficulties of large spans. The dome of the Pantheon is a half-sphere erected over a circular wall of concrete and lightened by a series of decorative coffers on its interior spherical surface. Its exterior surface, fig 13.5, more in the shape of a cone, is responsible for the increase of thickness of the dome towards its bottom. Other Roman domes had cracked under the tension in the lower hoops and Roman architects well knew the necessity of increasing a dome thickness in the area of its support. But the thickness towards the bottom of the dome was so unnecessarily large in the pantheon that great chambers were scooped out of it in order to reduce the dome's weight. As very dry and well-compacted concrete, typical of Roman craftsmanship, was being poured on the dome's scaffold in horizontal layers from top to bottom, the builders introduced lighter aggregates like pumice in the concrete of the upper part of the pantheon and inserted in the top concrete empty clay vessels, which further reduced its weight. The Romans also understood the hoop action of the dome's parallels. In order to avoid the pouring of concrete on a horizontal scaffold at the crown of the dome, 
they often left a circular opening. Or I there, see Fig 13.4. The rim of this opening was built of hard burnt bricks, well cemented. By excellent mortar, since it had to resist heavy compression in acting as the common keystone of all the meridional arches of the dome. The dimensions of the Pantheon's dome are extraordinary both in geometry and thickness. It spans 142 feet internally, has a minimum thickness of about 2 feet at the rim of its top opening and a maximum of 23 feet at its bottom. This bottom thickness is so large that the tensile hoop stresses in it are well below the resistance of the concrete, and only a few minor cracks have appeared in the weight-reducing chambers during the 18 centuries of its existence. The Pantheon was unsurpassed in span for 1,300 years, until the octagonal dome of the Cathedral of Florence outdid it by only three feet in its maximum span. Santa Maria del Fiore In 1417 the Commune of Florence, finally in possession of a cathedral fully representative of its culture and glory, decided to erect a dome over its cross IDG. Two basic limitations had to be accepted in the conception of this orc. First, the drum on which it was going to be supported had an octagonal shape and was surrounded on three sides by octagonal half domes, see Fig 13.7. Secondly, the brick model of the complete church, erected in 1367, showed the corner ribs of the proposed dome to have a particular profile, called a kinto akuto, consisting of pointed circular arches with a radius equal to four fifths of the crossing span, fig 13.6. The octagonal half domes around the drum also had this particular profile. Both structurally and aesthetically it was inconceivable that the great dome should not have an octagonal shape or present a different profile. The all-powerful construction guilds of Florence under the direction of the opera del Duomo, the board supervising the erection of the church, had sworn to adhere to the 1367 model, although nobody had yet made serious proposals concerning the execution of the project. In fact, it was known that as far back as 1394 the experts of the Opera del Duomo had expressed the opinion that the construction of the dome was so big and in such a state that it could not be completed and that it had been naive of the earlier masters and whoever else had deliberated on the matter to have believed it could be done. The idea of a scaffold or centre incapable of supporting such a monumental structure during its construction had always appeared outrageous to the experts of the time, indeed to all who had studied the problem since the cathedral was started in 1294 by Arnolfo di Cambio and continued by Francesco Talenti in 1357. Even after the completion in 1413 of the octagonal drum on which the dome was to be. Supported although the drum had been built 14 feet thick as a matter of wise precaution the cost of the centering alone had been a deterrent to the project. Notwithstanding these inauspicious beginnings, a competition for the construction of the dome was called in 1418. Some of the greatest architects of the time participated in it, but no winner was chosen. In 1419 Filippo Brunelleschi, a member of the Silk Guild trained as a goldsmith, painter, and sculptor, made a revolutionary proposal to the board, the dome or cupola could be built without a wooden centering. He submitted a brick model to prove it. The board took him seriously enough to pay for the model, even though no large dome had ever been built without an interior temporary support. This was a conservative time. Not far away the Sienese had renounced the grandiose concept of making their striped cathedral into the transept of a much larger church. Tuscany had been invaded and almost entirely conquered by the Viscontis of Milan. The art of building was in the hands of specialized guilds opposed both to new ideas and to the leadership of a single man. But Filippo Brunelleschi was not easily beaten. Although only 24 years old, he was already well known in his town as a superb sculptor who had placed second in the competition for the doors of the baptistery the so-called doors to paradise, and had proudly refused to collaborate with the winner, the great Ghiberti, in their execution. Son of an illustrious magistrate, Brunelleschi was a humanist at heart, a great mathematician particularly enamoured of geometry, 
a mechanic, an inventor of tools and clocks, a scholar who had dedicated years to the study of the divine comedy in order to grasp the many meanings of the great poem. Having in his opinion failed as a sculptor, he had travelled at his own expense to Rome to study its monuments and had come back to Florence fired with a sense of architectural mission. This time he did not fail. Over a period of only 27 years Brunelleschi created a new architecture, crowned by the completion of Santa Maria del Fiore which, together with the design and erection of the Pazzi Chapel, the Foundlings Hospital, the old sacristy of San Lorenzo, the new church of San Lorenzo and that of Santo Spirito, as well as numerous palaces, transformed Florence from a medieval town into the capital of the Italian Renaissance. By 1420 the board of the opera named Brunelleschi and Ghiberti co-architects of the Dome of Santa Maria del Fiore, and Battista D'Antonio master of the works, or as we would call him today, engineer of record. Brunelleschi accepted the partnership, then, guilefully feigning illness, showed Ghiberti to be incapable of proceeding alone and took complete charge of the project. He is referred to in written specifications for the job as the inventor. Filippo meant business. He took residence in a house at the foot of the dome. He chose the clay and the dimensions of the large bricks for the masonry and supervised their burning. He determined from which quarries the stone and the marble for the dome would come, established kitchens inside the church so that the workers would not waste time going out for food and erected scaffolds and banisters to make the masons work less dangerous and psychologically more comfortable. He refused to pay dues to the stone masons and woodworkers guild in order not to be taken for just another member. He trained crews to substitute for them when they struck. All in all he spent the next 16 years of his life bringing to fruition, day by day, his revolutionary idea. In 1436 the dome was finished, Fig. 13.7 dominating the city of Florence and the Tuscan countryside, it moved Alberti, the first historian of architecture, to write, who could be so hard or so invidious not to praise Pippo the architect in seeing here a structure so large, erected above the heavens, so wide as to cover with its shadow all the people of Tuscany, built without any help of centering or large amounts of wood, an invention which, if I am a good judge, as it was incredible in our own time that it could be done, it was not conceived or known by the ancients. The incredible invention of Pippo had many components, the most important of which was its double masonry dome, Fig. 13.8. This double dome consisted of a thick inner octagonal shell connected by meridional arched ribs to a thinner outer shell. The inner dome was thus protected from the weather, and the exterior of the cupola given a more domes. Majestic shape. Two domes increased the resistance of the entire structure and permitted the inspection of both domes from stairs and galleries meandering through the space between them. The most essential structural component of the domes consisted of its hoop six horizontal rings of sandstone reinforced on their outer surface by iron chains which would prevent the bursting of the domes under the enormous tensile forces in their parallels. While the Pantheon owed its strength to the brute weight of its thick masonry, the cupola consisted of two relatively thin, light domes, which relied on the strength of their stone and iron hoops to prevent collapse at any stage of construction. The skeleton of the cupola, Fig. 13.9, consists of the eight corner ribs in the shape akin to Akuto and of two additional smaller ribs located between the corner ribs on each side of the octagon. The corner ribs are 14 feet wide, the intermediate ribs 8 feet wide. Both are deep enough to connect the inner to the outer dome but decrease in depth, although not in width, as they grow from the base octagon to the top octagon. The top octagon acts as the keystone for all the 24 ribs and supports the magnificent lantern of hollow marble, then a conical roof that in Tan holds the golden ball and its cross. The inner dome is seven feet thick at the bottom and five at the top, the outer is two and one half feet at the bottom and one and one fourth feet at the domes. Top. Both domes consist of eight cylindrical faces that curve inward toward the axis of the dome but have straight horizontal sections throughout their height. 
The iron reinforced hoops of sandstone, embedded in the brick masonry of both domes at equal vertical intervals, have fulfilled their role as Brunelleschi conceived it. They prevent the bursting of the cupola and the appearance of those cracks that have required later remedies in all the large domes of the past, including Hagia Sophia and St. Peter's. Zero one must not think of the cupola as of a skeleton of meridional ribs and horizontal hoops supporting the thin surfaces of the inner and outer domes. Although most of the enormous weight of the cupola is carried to its octagonal base by the wide ribs, one must realize that the 24 ribs and the two domes reached the same height simultaneously DL, ring construction, and this is the key to the last component of Pippa's incredible invention, the erection of the largest dome ever. Built without the help of a centering. We owe to the meticulous and untiring efforts of Roland J. Mainstone the explanation of this miracle. The structure of the cupola can be inspected through five galleries, which run around it between its two domes one at the base and one at the top of the base octagon, two between the base and the top octagons, and one in the depth of the upper octagon. A walk through these galleries showed Mainstone clearly that above the third gallery each corner rib is connected to the two intermediate ribs right and left of it by nine evenly spaced sets of horizontal arches and that these arches, together with the portion of the outer dome between the intermediate ribs, constitute nine concentric horizontal circles, fig 13.10. Below the third gallery the inner dome is so thick that a fairly thick circular ring can be drawn entirely inside it. Mainstone thus proved that although the shape of the cupola is octagonal, it contains in its interior a number of circular rings, fig 13.10, and hence works structurally as a circular dome. As Brunelleschi knew from his studies of the Pantheon and other Roman domes, a circular dome is stable at all times during its construction because the uppermost completed ring acts as keystone for its meridional arches and prevents them from falling inward. Hence the circular dome stands without need of inner support during its erection, provided its tendency to burst at the parallels be prevented. And this Brunelleschi had achieved by means of the iron sandstone hoops. One may add that the profile of Kinto Akuto is so. Degree cracks have been recently discovered along the main ribs of the dome, but they are not recent, as shown by the frescoes that were painted around them originally. Pointed that its tendency to burst is about half as great as that of a shallower spherical dome. This could not have been known to the board, which most probably chose the rib's shape for pure aesthetic reasons, but it was certainly a contributing factor to the success of the enterprise. One more detail needed to fall into place before Brunelleschi's dome could be made to work. During construction the uppermost ring of a circular dome can act as keystone for all its meridians only when it is a complete ring capable of resisting compression. Unfortunately during construction the uppermost ring cannot be built instantaneously, and while it is incomplete and open, it cannot support all the meridians. Brunelleschi solved this conundrum by the simple expedient of connecting the incomplete uppermost ring under construction to the lower complete rings of the domes. He simply laid the bricks of the uppermost rings flat over those of the previously built rings but interrupted these layers of flat brick by inserting vertical bricks between them every three feet. The vertically laid bricks follow a spiral curve along the surface of the domes, each tying the upper masonry to three of the lower layers, creating a herringbone pattern in the masonry, fig 13.11. As the time needed for setting the mortar was shorter than that required to complete a new layer of bricks, each incomplete layer under construction was always key to domes. Three lower layers and sustained the inward push of the meridians leaning on it. Brunelleschi also understood that for the brick masonry to work as does the continuous concrete of a dome, the bricks should not be laid horizontally but at right angles to the dome surface, that is, with an inward inclination, increasing together with the height of the dome. The herringbone spirals of vertical bricks had the additional purpose of preventing the sliding of the flat bricks on their inclined surfaces by tying them to the masonry that had already set. 
An inspection of the lie of the bricks of both the outer and the inner dome shows how Brunelleschi had carefully studied the influence of these construction details on the strength of the cupola and why he could so forcefully assert to the supervising board that the inner and outer domes could be built without centering and that the cupola would neither burst nor fall inward under its own weight. Brunelleschi saw the duomo completed and his conception proven uncannily correct. He then designed its ethereal lantern of hollow marble and the special tackle required for its erection. But he was not allowed to enjoy the completion of his labours. He died in 1446 when the lantern lay at the foot of the cupola ready to be lifted to the top of the upper octagon. His body lies inside the cathedral next to a plaque expressing the admiration of the Florentine people for one of its greatest sons. In the hilly countryside around Florence many hamlets and localities are called apparita or apparenza, that is, apparition or appearance. At these spots the traveller will suddenly see, as the road turns, the profile of the cupola, first just its lantern, then more and more of its unique profile. Thus he will know that he is approaching the city. But in Italian the word apparition is used almost exclusively in connection with the why buildings stand up. Miraculous apparition of the angel to the virgin, and the miracle of the cupola's apparition is certainly connected with this religious tradition. The name of the cathedral itself could not give a clearer indication of the feeling elicited by the Sudan vision of the cupola, it is the dome of Saint Mary of the Flower. Modern Domes How much better than the master builders of the past have modem engineers and architects been able to do? As far as domes are concerned, the tools of modem design, the electronic computer and model analysis, have allowed today's average technologists to achieve results that few geniuses of the past could have dreamed of. This does not imply that modem domes are more significant or more beautiful than those of the past, most are not, but only that their dimensions far exceed those of the domes built before the Industrial Revolution. Actually, one could easily prove that while technology has leaped ahead in devising new ways and materials for the erection of monumental domes, architecture has not kept up with it and that, except for the works of men like Nervi and Sorinen, no modem roof can compete with Hagia Sophia, Santa Maria del Fura, or St. Peter's. The largest span roof built to date is the triangular base, concrete dome of the Centre National des Industries at Des Techniques in Paris designed by Zephus and engineered by Esquilin in 1968, Fig 13.12. It consists of three enormous buttresses, springing from the comers of an equilateral triangle with 720 foot sides and meeting 152 feet above the center of the triangle. The three buttresses constitute a double dome with a lower shell and an upper shell each only two and one half inches thick, connected by vertical diaphragms of the same thickness set in a rectangular pattern. Fig 13.13. The upper shell is corrugated across the direction of the buttresses to increase their buckling strength. The three comers of the dome were poured on wooden scaffolds. The upper parts of the buttresses were built without centering. Movable steel forms were used for the inner shell while the upper shell was poured on wood fiberboard forms supported by the vertical diaphragms. The central portions of the three buttresses were poured simultaneously starting at the three comers, and became self-supporting. Upon meeting at the top of the roof, the lateral portions of the three buttresses were then poured, widening the buttresses to their final dimensions in three separate operations, Fig 13.14. Domes Why should it be that the largest dome in the world is built of concrete rather than steel? The reason for this apparent contradiction is that the dimensions, shape, and materials of our monuments are always dictated by the tyranny of economy. Depending on the availability of materials and of specialized manpower, on fabrication procedures and engineering traditions, concrete may be competitive in a given country or location at a given time, while steel may be more economical at another location or time. If the architect is sometimes inclined to put beauty first, 
the engineer never forgets that economy must prevail for a project to become reality. The fact is that our monuments are more often engineering rather than architectural achievements, except when the designer is at domes. The same time a great engineer and a superb architect. Perhaps the only man to fulfill these contradictory requirements in our time was Pierre Luigi Nervi. Thus the largest dome built to date in steel is the Louisiana Superdome, which covers a stadium rather than a church, and the second largest, the Astrodome, Fig. 13.15, is also a roof under which any kind of sports can be played. It would be naive and dishonest to deny the technological feat of erecting one of these roofs, covering 9 to 10 acres, seating up to 70,000 spectators, and employing materials of such strength that their weight is less than 30 pounds per square foot of roof. Brunelesh's inner dome alone weighed 700 pounds per square foot. Neither can one deny the technical elegance of their structural design, the ingenuity of their construction procedures, or the immense feeling of space they create. Even so, though their dimensions call forth admiration, we are not moved by the space they create. When the dimensions of a structure are so large that they cannot be grasped through an act of pure intuition, our capacity for emotion is stunted. We may still be awed by a mountain or by the waves of a tempestuous ocean. These are the works of nature. But we seem to be unable to grasp the greatness of our own achievements unless we participate in their realization or they are interpreted for us in the language of the artist or the philosopher. The triumphs of modern technology become meaningful to us only when they can be admired from such a distance that their dimensions become human. The beauty of the Vera Sano Narrows Bridge, of the New York skyline, or of the CNIT Exhibition Hall can only be perceived from a distance. And yet one knows that we shall strive towards greater heights, larger spans, and wider areas, driven by many impulses the most important of which is and will always be of a spiritual nature. Each era has expressed this impulse through different means, but nobody can doubt that the spirit of an age is clearly expressed by its architecture. Since there cannot be architecture without structure, let us praise the hidden skeleton that allows us to realize beauty through the collaboration of architecture and technology. 14 Hagia Sophia The Construction of the Church We owe the miracle of Hagia Sophia to the vision of Justinian the Lawgiver, fourth Christian Roman Emperor, and to the ruthlessness of his wife, Theodora a former circus performer and international courtesan. But the erection of this most famous of all Byzantine churches, Fig. 14.1, the only Christian church in the world used uninterruptedly through 14 centuries to worship God the One, came about because of an unexpected and tragic event. For over 30 years Justinian had dedicated himself to two goals, to stem the pressure of the barbarian invasions at the periphery of his wide empire and to create at its eastern heart a lasting monument to himself. By the time of his death in AD 565, at the age of 82, he had been more successful with the second than with the first, the barbarian tide had been barely stemmed, but over a thousand monuments and churches had been built in the city founded by Constantine the Great in AD. 330, the achievement of Justinian's two ambitious goals demanded large amounts of money, and taxation under Justinian had been high and unevenly spread. The populace, for these many years docile under this financial burden, revolted in 532. With the cry of Nika, conquer, they took over the city, looting and burning everywhere. Justinian, an introverted and cultured man, ready to compromise, spoke to the people massed in the Hippodrome, but to no avail. He might have fled the capital at this time, had it not been for the stand taken by Theodora, who swore. 246. That she would not flee even if the emperor abandoned his throne. Reassured by her determination. Justinian decided to put down the rebellion. When the fighting ended 30,000 men, women, and children lay dead in the streets, but not before the populace had set a fire and destroyed the important church of Hagia Sophia dedicated to the holy wisdom of Christ by Constantine II. 
Its wooden roof had made it easy prey to the flames. It took Justinian just 39 days to decide that the reconstruction of this church was to be done on a scale unprecedented in human history and to set forth on the path. The man entrusted with the realization of Justinian's dream was Anthemius of Trowels, a Greek from Asia Minor steeped in mathematics and physics, one of the greatest architect engineers of all time. Anthemius's assistant was Isidorus the Elder, also a Greek, from Miletus. On February 23, 532, the erection of the church began with 100 overseers and a force of 10,000 workers. The workers were divided into two gangs, one for the northern and the other for the southern half of the building, so as to create competition and simultaneous progress. At the end of the day the workers were allowed to search for coins buried in the excavated soil as compensation beyond their regular wages. 1. Feels that there is in all this more than meets the eye, for the construction of the church had obvious social overtones concerning unemployment and wages. Justinian had surely requested his architect for plans of the new church well before the destruction of the old, homonymous one. Even the genius of Anthemius could not have conceived and produced them in such a short time. Justinian roamed the site day and night dressed in work clothes, giving advice and encouragement. At a time when the uprights of the scaffold for one of the great arches seemed in danger of splitting under the enormous weight of the arch and even Anthemius had lost his self-assurance, the emperor advised him to continue the construction or the arch because when it rests upon itself, it will no longer need the uprights under it. Indeed, Hagia Sophia was Justinian's monument in all ways. He would go without food for a full day when engrossed in the work. He was able at times to sleep only an hour a night because, as Gibbon stated, the body was awakened by the soul. It is no wonder that under his obsessive drive the construction of the largest Christian church ever built, covering 81,375 square feet and topped by the most daring dome ever conceived, was completed in five years, ten months, and four days. On December 27,537, Justinian, after riding from his palace on a white horse, dismounted in front of the church, took the hand of the Patriarch of Constantinople, and walked with him through the atrium and the narthex, entering the magnificently decorated, immense nave. At this point he dropped the patriarch's hand, ran to the center of the church, and looking at the floating dome, cried, Glory to God, who has deemed me worth of fulfilling such a work. Zero Solomon, I have surpassed thee. Thus was inaugurated fourteen centuries ago the Justinian version of Hagia Sophia, a church revered by people of all races and religions, sung about in Latin hexameters. By the poet Paul the Silentiary, written about by visitors from all corners of the world, and paradoxically, thoroughly known only in recent times, after it stopped functioning as a house of worship. The interior of the church There are many reasons for this universal admiration. The interior of Hagia Sophia during its nine centuries of Christian Orthodox worship was a space of almost incredible opulence, Fig. 14.2. Marbles gathered from all parts of the empire paved the church floor, the pieces dovetailing. So, as to create a flow of color that reminded visitors of the sea. The monolithic green columns grew from the floor to support each of the lateral walls under the great north and south arches. Above these rose six red columns at the level of the women's galleries, and the entire walls were covered with marble below and mosaic above. Areas outside the main nave were populated by columns, 250 of them, of the finest marbles. They supported barrel vaults, also covered with mosaics. At the entrance to the church, Fig. 14.3, the narthex vaults, all four of them, were covered with mosaics, the large center one representing Christ the infant on the lap of his virgin mother. The narthex was followed by a large space, roofed by a half-dome supported on marble columns, and the apse at the opposite end of the church was closed by another half-dome pierced by five windows and encrusted with mosaics. 
in contrast to the dark side galleries, supported by smaller decorated vaults on columns, the center space of the church, a 100-foot square expanse with enormously massive pillars at its four corners, was lit by the 40 windows at the base of the dome. The light from these windows contributed to the sensation that the shallow spherical dome floated over the church rather than being supported by the four great arches and four curved surfaces, the pendentives, tha dot led from the square. And defined by the comma pillars to its own circular base. As Procopius wrote, it seems not to rest on solid masonry, but to cover the space with its golden dome suspended from heaven. The four pendentives were covered with mosaics representing four angels, while the entire dome was a golden surface with a large figure of Christ the creator of the world Pantocrator floating over the center of this immense space. When the patriarch and the emperor entered this central, warmly illuminated area, they must have looked superhuman to the populace crowding the dark side galleries and floor spaces. But the people themselves were to enter this miraculous area shortly thereafter to accept the sacrament of communion and to become equals to the heads of church and empire. The new state religion and its rituals had both exalted the temporal power of the ruler and made him human in the eyes of the people. The orthodox rituals were no less magnificent at night. Daylight from the forty dome windows was then replaced by the light of eighty lamps attached to the base of the dome. In addition three circles of concentric lights hung from the dome. Oil lamps were supported on the lower columns as well as on the walls above the lateral arches and on the periphery of the church. All these lights, reflected by marbles and mosaics, created a truly magical atmosphere. All architecture bears a message. The message created by Anthemius for his emperor, his patriarch, and his people rang loud and clear. This space, a symbol of the protective love of the church and empire, is covered by curved surfaces, which embrace and protect the people humbly assembled to pray for the protection of the great king of the Jews, God made man for their salvation. But the magnificent interior does also signify the greatness of the state and gives assurance of its strength and magnanimity. The light supporting the dome made it into a dome of heaven and elevated the spirit to celestial thoughts, but also served to hood down the opulent walls and arches and domes, reminding worshippers of the richness of the emperor's palace. Meanwhile the church orientation pointed to the rising sun and to the hopes of the world, and the altar under the eastern half-dome roofing the apse lay. In its semi-darkness to increase the mystery of the mass. Seldom have two such. Contrasting messages as those broadcast by Hagia Sophia been incorporated in a single, harmonious, and mesmerizing architectural ambience. When such a goal is achieved, we are confronted with the greatest of architecture. Anthemius, who bent all of his knowledge and vision to this achievement, at times allowed his artistic daring to overcome his technical judgment. The result was a series of structural failures he did not live to witness. Even so, it is the incredible contrast between the sensuous decoration of Hagia. Sophia's interior and the almost abstract geometrical shapes of its structure that must be understood if one is to appreciate the greatness of Anthemius's conception. The structure of the church. Unfortunately the successive accretions to the church's exterior, either required to strengthen it or added later for functional purposes, do not allow us to see the original construction of Anthemius. But we can reconstruct it. Consider a square with four pillars at its comers, Fig. 14.4. The space between each couple of pillars is spanned by a full arch in the shape of a half circle, whose rise equals half its span. A horizontal circle is supported on the crowns of these four arches and a dome rises from it. The original dome was not a full dome, with a rise of 4 to 5 feet, but rose only to approximately 25 feet. Hence it was shallow, more like an upside-down dish. The dish dome was reinforced and made stiffer by 40 equally spaced radial ribs meeting at the top of the dome, where they vanished. 40 windows were set at the dome's base, between the 40 ribs. Spherical surfaces plugged the opening between the horizontal ring at the bottom of the dome and the halves of the arches at right angles to 
each other rising from each pillar. These spherical surfaces, the pendentives, were triangular in form, with their lower comma resting on the pillar. This was the essence of the structure supporting the original dome. Except for the dome itself it has remained unchanged to this day. The lateral arches supporting the dome and open to north and south are partly filled by walls, which rest on four large green marble columns. These columns in tum hold up six smaller red marble columns, which support the walls. These walls were perforated by three rows of windows, and hence, together with the two rows of columns at their bases, presented a light open apparent. The lower row of windows was plugged later, without substantially changing the wall's appearance. The western arch on the entrance side and the eastern arch on the app side are not plugged by walls but are flanked, outside the square plan, by two half domes resting on the main two east and two west. Some pillars and on two additional pairs of smaller pillars, to the east and to the west of the main east and west pillars, see Fig. 14.3. These large half domes are in tum flanked by two smaller half domes and a barrel vault. The barrel vaults are in line with the east-west axis of the church, and the eastern barrel vault is closed by a last half dome, which constitutes the roof of the apse. All the smaller half domes are supported, like the lateral walls, by two sets of columns set on semicircles. Finally, outside the lateral north and south walls two aisles are created by longitudinal rows of columns connected by barrel vaults, and an outside wall encloses the entire church in a 200-foot square. The geometrical scheme of the structure is simple and seems to correspond to the scheme of the interior space. What remains to be explained is why the two lateral arches were plugged by walls. While the east and west arches were continued into a series of large and smaller half domes, so as to give the church a longitudinal plan. The reason for this lack of total centrality is to be found in the requirements of the liturgy as well as in the Byzantine tradition of church construction. Many prior Byzantine churches were built with a completely centralized plan and were roofed by wooden domes. The first Hagia Sophia seems to have been built in conformity with this arrange. Meant. But the Roman structural scheme for buildings where large numbers of people gathered was that of the basilica, a longitudinal building with a wide central aisle terminating in an apse and lateral, usually narrower, aisles covered by a wooden truss roof. Anthemius, confronted with these two traditions as well as with the requirements of the mass liturgy, which called for the altar being situated at one end of the church, devised a compromise. The centered square structure was given an elongated appearance internally by screening the lateral arches with pierced walls and by prolonging the dome longitudinally. By means of larger and smaller half domes. In so doing he achieved an unencumbered span of 102 feet in the transverse direction and one of over 200 feet in the longitudinal direction, a span never Before achieved. Thus was dimension made supreme and almost infinite to the naked eye. And to make the other human dimension time also infinite, he decided to avoid the use of wood in the roofing of the space. His Hagia Sophia was going to be fireproof. As a consequence of the avoidance of wood, the large spans could only be covered with arches, barrel vaults, and domes, shapes that allow the use of compressive materials like stone and brick. It is seen that, once Anthemius had decided to satisfy the needs of liturgy, to realize a grandiose space, and to aim at eternity, his choice of structure simply followed. And this correspondence between architectural requirements and structural needs is another characteristic of great architecture. A good engineer, Anthemius used his materials wisely. He knew that the four main pillars and the four secondary pillars would have to support the weight of most of the structure and resist the thrust of the dome. Therefore he made them of granite, a heavy, strong stone. The horizontal surfaces of the granite blocks were carefully smoothed out to make sure the pressure on them would be evenly distributed. At critical joints sheets of lead were interposed between the blocks to ensure perfect contact between them. Stone in the shape of columns was also used to support the walls, the half-domes, and the lateral vaults. 
but the vaults, half domes, and the great dome itself had to be made as light as possible to reduce their weight and the consequent thrusts on the pillars and columns. Hence they were built of Byzantine bricks, measuring approximately a foot and a half square and about two inches thick. The bricks were joined by Li Jie, the mortar, a material which slowly becomes as hard as the brick and which smooths out any imperfections between adjoining brick surfaces. Enormous wooden scaffolds had to be built to support the arches, the vaults, and the domes during construction, until the mortar set and bound them into an almost monolithic structure. Hagia Sophia In order to understand where Anthemius partly failed, one must become aware of both historical and structural causes. The Romans had perfected the arch, the vault, and the dome and had built domes as large as that of the Pantheon, 142 feet in diameter, by developing concrete, a material capable of standing a small amount of tension. In addition, most wisely, they made their curved roofs very thick and always supported domes all around their base. But the tradition of concrete dome construction had been lost. Moreover, for the first time in the history of the dome Anthemius conceived of supporting one, and the largest so far, at Fiat, on four corner pillars. This was a revolutionary conception because of course domes, like arches, have a tendency to spread under loads. If they are not to fail by opening up at their base and cracking at their crown, their supports must be restrained from moving outward. Hence the dome thrusts at Hagia Sophia had to be resisted by the for supporting arches and the thrusts of these arches by other structures in turn. Anthemius knew all this, not in a strictly mathematical way as the modern engineer does, but more or less intuitively. He wisely buttressed the east and west arches by means of the large half domes and these in turn by means of the smaller half domes and vaults until the dome thrust in the east and west direction was brought down to earth. If he could have used the same mechanism to resist the thrust in the north and south directions, as the Turks did later in the Blue Mosque, he would have encountered no problems. But the architectural needs of his space did not allow him this solution, and he had to invent makeshift remedies. He made the unpropped north and south arches smaller in span so they would thrust less, and thicker, so they would be stronger. In addition, he supported the north and south walls by a second hidden arch under the main arch. He finally propped up each main pillar by means of an additional buttress connected to the pillar by means of vaults, anticipating the system of buttresses used by the builders of the later Gothic cathedrals. The idea of filling the smaller north and south arches with lateral walls provides a measure of his greatness as an architect. Through an optical illusion, the walls give these smaller arches an appearance identical to those of the larger, open east and west arches and the difference in span is practically unnoticeable. The Fate of Hagia Sophia Anthemius knew he had designed and built the largest and most beautiful church in the world. He was aware of the tremendous structural problems Anthemius the engineer had overcome to allow Anthemius the architect to triumph. He died the recognized master builder of all time. But only 21 years after the consecration of his masterpiece, following two earthquakes in 553 and 557, the eastern arch with the abutting half dome. And part of the main dome collapsed. The intuition of Anthemius was insufficient to grasp quantitatively the play of forces among the elements of the church and yet the collapse might not have taken place were it not for the numerous earthquakes to which the church was subjected all through its life. The direct cause of the collapse was the insufficient buttressing of the main dome by the lateral arches, under the thrust of the dome and the shrinking of the slowly setting mortar, the north and south arches moved slightly outwards, allowing the supports of the eastern arch to spread, the crown to crack, and the half dome to collapse. It goes without saying that Justinian decided immediately to rebuild the dome. His new architect, Isidorus the Younger, a nephew of Anthemius's associate, aware of the enormous thrusts exerted by the shallow dome, rebuilt it in the shape of an almost full half-sphere, thus increasing its rise by 20 feet and reducing the thrust by 30%. The top of the dome now soared 180 feet over the level of the church floor. 
The church stands to this day with the profile given to it by Isuwarus the Younger. But the essential weakness of the original buttresses was still there. In 1989 the western arch and half dome collapsed. In an attempt to stem these failures, two enormous corner buttresses were built outside each of the north and south sides of the church under Emperor. Andronicus the Elder, see Fig. 14.3. But these buttresses, which deface the exterior of the church to this day, were unable to prevent a second collapse of the eastern arch in 1346, following another severe earthquake. By this time the knowledge of buttressing which had climaxed in the construction of the Gothic cathedrals in the west, had spread, and the repairs took only a few months. Finally in 1847 the church was strengthened by modern means under the supervision of the Swiss architects Gaspar and Giuseppe Fossati. They circled the base of the dome with an iron chain, see chapter 13, and thus reduced the dome's thrust to the point where they dared to dismantle the upper parts of some of the more recent lateral buttresses. The church, made secure structurally, withstood other earthquakes without signs of weakness. The dream of Anthemius was finally realized, but ironically the Hagia Sophia that may last in Eternum is not his church. It is not even a church. Hagia Sophia Through, through the centuries Hagia Sophia suffered more at the hands of men than from the forces of nature. First its interior was desecrated by the Christian sect of the iconoclasts, who destroyed many of the mosaic images in order to cleanse the church of corruption. Then the church was looted by the Christian crusaders from the west, who converted it for 57 years to the Roman Catholic ritual. Finally, in 1453, Mohammed II, the youthful, great leader of the Ottoman Turks and the conqueror of Constantinople, converted Hagia Sophia into a mosque. At first this conversion did not appreciably affect the interior of the church, since the cultured sultan was so impressed by Hagia Sophia that he allowed it to remain untouched. While the Christian crusaders had looted the interior of its treasures, Mohammed, upon noticing one of his soldiers pry some precious marbles from its walls for the glory of the faith, smote him with his sword and thus made his reverence for the church clear to all his followers. He even left its name unchanged, Hagia. Sophia became the Aya Sophia Mosque. Its appearance was changed only on the exterior and was possibly improved by the Fuminaret successively built by three later sultans. But when in the middle of the 18th century, in accordance with Quranic law, the mosaics were whitewashed, the building lost its opulent appearance and sent out a new message. With all images wiped out, with rugs covering the marbled floor, with large round panels and Arabic inscriptions defacing the pendentives, with new lights hanging from the roof and reaching down over the heads of the worshippers, with the mirab set in the apse off the church's axis to point towards Mecca, and with the Murzin's prayer echoing from the top of the high minarets, Hagia Sophia had become a severe and more spiritual monument, lacking the luster of its previous mundane glory and seemingly unconscious of the sultans who had transformed Constantinople into Istanbul. Paradoxically, the new naked interior enhanced the purity of the building's structure. Undistracted by the decoration now under whitewash, the visitor could take in the abstract lines of the dome and its supporting arches, half domes, pillars, and columns better than one could ever have done before. This purity of lines, this unearthly quality, was part of the new message that for 500 years the building was going to send out. Who would have thought that the miracle of Justinian was going to undergo one more drastic transformation at the hands of the Muslim conquerors, that the Fossati reconstruction was not to be final in our own time? Caves, where curved inner pseudices give us a feeling for arch action in space. Seashells, Fig. 17.9, are a symbol of protection, but they also have a strong aesthetic content, whenever they are ribbed in any of the great variety of ways in which nature has shown us how to stiffen a curved three-dimensional surface. The vine catenaries linking tree to tree show us the need for an upward curvature in attention. Structure like a suspension bridge, 
a requirement that modern engineering well understands. It would seem, therefore, that to the layman the semiotic message of structure comes from a series of atavistic intuitions and that the accumulation of these intuitions results in a set of aesthetic responses. This is why the layman considers a correctly designed cantilever beam as lovely and a cantilever with incorrect structural dimensions as ugly, see fig 17.7. Shifting our attention to some structures which have only recently come into common use for example, steel frames hinged at their base, fig 17.10, we notice that their structural message is equivocal to the lay reader. Consequently it appears that such structures do not have, as yet, much aesthetic content for the layman nor do they bespeak beauty to the experts. While the curved shape of an arch has a strong aesthetic charge, a frame appears to be a utilitarian structure, and one would be hard put to mention a building which has enhanced its aesthetics by the use of such a structural element. A similar reaction is elicited by those correct structural shapes that have their justification in. all physical phenomena. For example, a straight rod with a shape dictated by resistance to buckling, fig 17.11, is hardly viewed as beautiful or ugly, most of the time it is looked upon as a machine component. In fact, machines are often considered ugly because while their shapes are totally correct from a structural and a functional point of view, they are so new that we cannot grasp them yet as part of the universe of aesthetics. It is true that some artists at the beginning of this century, theme and ledger, for one, introduced machine. Like elements into their paintings. But they were careful to dissociate the painted image from the world of mechanical reality, Picabia's famous machines do not work. Semiotic message and scale. It is interesting to notice that scale does not seem to impair the semiotic message of large man-made structures. The reference of the message to the common experiences of the race seems to be unaffected by size, as shown by the comparison of almost any tensile structure to a spider web. Because of the efficiency of tension, tensile structures are always exceptionally light and, whatever their shape and size, are coincided elegant by the layman, see Fig 15.3. It is interesting to notice at this point that no times domed structure is lighter than a modern. Balloon roof, fig 17.12. But it's natural. Shape, which should look elegant to the inexperienced eye because of its lightness and translucency, is not yet comprehended aesthetically and is more a source of puzzlement than of appreciation. From the outside most WHY buildings stand UP. Balloon structures spell heaviness, and this is an obstacle to their general acceptance. The traditional message of the stone dome in compression does not allow us, as yet, to understand the recent pneumatic structural message, which therefore confuses us both structurally and aesthetically. This confusion does not arise with tents. These pure tensile structures have their counterparts in nature. They have also been seen by the race for thousands of years. Hence both real tents, fig 17.13, and similar tensile roofs elicit the kind of aesthetic appreciation. Showered on most curved structures modeled after nature. 11. I. should not consider the understanding of structural behavior a necessary condition for the aesthetic appreciation of a structure. A striking example of the unimportance of structural understanding is given by the shape of a roof universally admired aesthetically while seldom understood structurally. The hyperbolic paraboloid, one of the most efficient structural roof forms, is blessed by a feature often appearing both in nature and in modern sculpture, a saddle shape. From a structural point of view hyperbolic paraboloids can be correctly used in a more or less horizontal position to create roofs, or in a structurally unjustifiable vertical setting like walls, see fig. 11.30, but their aesthetic message is always one of beauty. 
The reaction of a 12-year Old, who had never before seen a roof shaped like the Hyper in figure 17.14, may indicate some of the aesthetic associations dictated by the semiotic message of the hyperbolic paraboloid. He first saw the similarity to a horse saddle, but then on second thought added, it also looks like a bird flying. In some cases even an unconscious understanding of the correctness of a structure may enhance its aesthetic content. In a slap with ribs curved along lines where the plate does not carry loads by twisting, see Fig. 11.7, the pattern of the ribs becomes a source of aesthetic satisfaction even for those who would not dream that twisting takes place in a plate, see Chapter 11. One wonders if the puzzling message of certain structures will ever permit aesthetic acceptance of their behavior. The shape of pre-stressed concrete elements, governed by the tension in their invisible tendons, contradicts our intuition of a logical shape. What will be the aesthetic reaction of future generations to roofs floated in space by electromagnetic fields of force, fig, 17.15? These invisible fields have no reference in nature and seem to defy its basic laws. This defiance is both puzzling and shocking since there can be no doubt about the satisfaction from a semiotic message aesthetically and structurally understood. It is this satisfaction, this harmony between the visual need for beauty and the respect for basic laws of nature, that has dictated in the past and dictates even more in the present, the tendency to exhibit the structure of a building. The same satisfaction is the source of our admiration for the Roman vaults, on the one hand, and the John Hancock Insurance Company building in Chicago, on the other, see Fig. 7.9. The Varying Semiotic Message Although the semiotic message of a structure is strictly related to our personal experience and culturally to the experience of the race, within a short number of years our aesthetic appreciation of a given structure can change, as proven by the classic example of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, see Fig. 8.1. As we have seen, this extraordinary steel structure, erected by an engineer of genius, originally had a limited purpose and was to be dismantled at the closing of an exhibition. The campaign against its erection involved some of the most respected representatives of French culture of the time, but it did not take long for the tower to become not. Just one of the symbols of that center of world culture called Paris but its very symbol. And a few years later the tower, on its own structural steam, became the semiotic symbol of France. In this extraordinary case, the total semiotic message stems directly and uniquely from a structural message. The Eiffel Tower is a structural masterpiece in which almost nothing was conceded to decoration, nothing used to hide its necessary sinews. Its acceptance indicates not only an amazing reversal of public opinion but the possibility of a pure aesthetic message emanating from a pure structure. A similar interaction between structural and aesthetic needs preserved the nakedness of the towers of the George Washington Bridge, see Fig. 10.6, despite the opposition of a large part of the New York intelligentsia and of the designing engineer himself another indication of the rapid change in aesthetic appreciation of the semiotic message of a structure. The Beauborg Museum has just recently been inaugurated in Paris, Fig. 17.16. The dismay of the world at the erection of an art shelter with an aesthetic message based not only on its visible structure but on its mechanical systems must be understood in the light of our recent historical past. One cannot forecast that the Beauborg will become the new symbol of Paris or of modern art. But one should not be surprised if the incorporation of mechanical elements into its aesthetic message leads to a widening of the vocabulary of architecture and becomes accepted as a matter of course within a few years. After all, if the last operas of Mozart were criticized as noise, not music by Viennese critics of the time, if the early 20th century French painters were called the wild beasts, if Joyce's Ulysses was bitterly attacked, 
why should the aesthetic message of structural and mechanical systems enjoy a different reception? It may be surprising to realize, at the end of this rapid excursion through the field of architectural structures, that such a highly technological field has contributed and will continue to contribute to our innate need for beauty. To those of us who cannot live without beauty, this is an encouraging thought. The separation of technology and art is both unnecessary and incorrect, one is not an enemy of the other. Instead it is essential to understand that technology is often a necessary component of art and that it helps technology to serve man better. Nowhere is this more true than in architecture and structure, a marriage in which science and beauty combine to fulfill some of the most basic physical and spiritual needs of humanity. Thank you so much for listening. Please considering subscribing to our channel.